lives of fictional characters. But through the pages of a non-fiction, we see the lives of our neighbors. For those born in privilege of caste, education, ability and opportunity, inclusion is a matter of social belief. But for those born without them, it's a matter of survival. We sit today in the safe environs of this air-conditioned room only to look at these lives like passers-by, but wait till you hear our next author. Ashutosh Bharadwaj is a bilingual journalist, writes both fiction and non-fiction, and is a literary critic. From 2011 to 2015, he lived in India's Red Corridor and made several trips thereafter reporting on the Maoists, on the state's atrocities, and on the lives caught in the crossfire. In his present book, The Death Script, he writes of his time there, of the various men and women he meets from both sides of the conflict, bringing home with astonishing power the human cost of such a battle. Travelling widely in Maoist country, he documents the condition of the tribes caught in the, uh, caught in the cause fire between the Maoist insurgents and the government. He is the only journalist to have won the Ramnath Goenka Award for Excellence for four consecutive years. The Dead Script won the Best Nonfiction Book of the Year 2020 at a Galata Award. His journalistic writing has been shortlisted for several prestigious awards like the Tata Lit Fest 2020 and Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay Award. He is the recipient of the Krishna Baldev Ved Fellowship for Innovation Fiction and he was the Sangam House Bangalore Writer in Residence for 2012-2013. He has also been a fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. Moderating the session today uh, is a technocrat, a blogger and reader, Hitendra Kant, who heads a tech company as VP Human Resources. I request Mr. Hitendra Kant to please usher our author for today, Mr. Ashutosh Bharadwaj on the dais. Yeah. Uh, people in the back, I'm audible properly, right? Ashutosh, a uh, very warm welcome uh, to VLF and uh, welcome to all of you uh, at this session. Um, I have read Ashutosh, uh, his book, uh, The Death Script, and, and I think all of you, some of you might have read it, and if you go on and read it, you will really enjoy reading it. Uh, we begin with your, uh, a little bit of introduction, uh, Ashutosh. So, where do you belong and how did you, like, uh, end up becoming a journalist and a writer both? How did I end up becoming a journalist? Okay. And, and maybe we can start a little bit of like your education, where okay. do you come from? So, uh, it's always a bit presumptuous to talk about how do you want to, okay. So, I realized right in my early teens that the maximum joy that I derive out of any activity, if, if I may use the word quote-unquote activity, that was writing. Mm. But then it took me a while to gather the courage to decide that perhaps this is the only vocation that I want to have, that is of a writer. Right. Now, journalism, I also realized that perhaps in India, uh, you cannot live a life of a writer, you cannot sustain that, you need to have some resources. So, uh, what is the option then? I could have either worked as a teacher or maybe in some publishing house or as a journalist. So for me, journalism offered uh, a lot which was very close to my writerly desires. Adventure, uh, travels, going out. This is how I came to journalism. Yes, uh, but then you have, uh, you, you went on to do actually very serious journalism later on and, and you have like worked extensively in very intense situations uh, and, and places, right? So you have now these two roles, uh, role of a journalist and role of an author. How would you identify, would you identify more with one or, or less with the other? See, anybody who wants to write, uh, uh, that person is engaged in a conversation with the other. Why do you write? One, one explanation is that I want to express what I feel. But this is only in preliminary stages. In, in your preliminary stages, you want to write about your love, your unemployment, your hunger. But as you evolve as a writer, you are always in a conversation, in a negotiation, in an exchange with the outside world. So for me, uh, journalism is 
just yet another form of exchange or conversation with the outside world. As a fiction writer, I write about certain characters who are fictional but who are drawn from uh, my immediate environment. As a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a journalist, I have the liberty uh, to take them to choose the exact correct characters, exact people which I do not have in fiction. Some people say that fiction gives you more liberty yeah, and that's true. But journalism also gives you greater space because then you can directly talk about certain, one, certain person who has influenced you. Yes, exactly. Anyway, um, and then let's, let's come to this book uh, and before that, you are a, a bilingual author. So, so you're very comfortable and, and very prolific one into Hindi uh, and, and you've written novels in Hindi. I mean, um, you have a Hindi novel, Pitrivad, if, if I'm correct. Oh, that's a book of literary criticism. <laughs> Pitrivad, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, uh, that's a book on novels. A book on novels. Uh, on novels. Upanyaso par meri alochana hai wo, ji. And then uh, you also are very comfortable and at home uh, when you write in English, right? So, does it just come naturally, this bilingual uh, expertise or, or uh, something? There, there is some, something to, behind it. Well, I guess my DNA, that double helix, that the two <laughs> stand right, Hindi, English, they go together. Yeah. A part of me thinks in Hindi, a part of me thinks in, in English. A part of me believes that certain expressions may best be expressed in English. A part of mine believes, you know, this expression can best be expressed in Hindi. And then both these parts are always in a constant conversation with each other. So uh, my Hindi part would tell to my English part, you know, you have to... Like, for instance, I believe that my Hindi lends a mythicality, a romance uh, to my language, whereas English brings a degree of rationalism and an outsider approach to look uh, to my uh, experiences. So both these selves then are in a constant negotiation. So my Hindi part would always try to dilute or question. I just give you an example here. Uh, like, in, this is a very, one of my most favorite examples. In English, uh, if I'm asked to write an essay on the cow, so I would begin by saying the cow is a domestic animal. Effortlessly I would begin like that. In Hindi when I'm asked to write an essay on cow, I may very well write Gai Hamari Mata Hai. Yes. Right. In English I wouldn't, I would never say the cow is my mother. Similarly, in Hindi, despite being very liberal and all that, I, nahi nahi yaar, Gai Paltu Pashu nahi hai. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so this is how my, both the languages are in a constant, uh, conversation with each other, constantly uh, the, uh, make, bringing a checks and balance upon each other. Now, coming to the book, you were with the Indian Express uh, and you were posted in uh, Chhattisgarh. Uh, uh, and and uh, between 2011 and 15, I believe, and that was like the time of, probably the peak of the insurgency, Maoist insurgency in Chhattisgarh. Uh, while covering it and writing reports, when did this idea come that this can take form of a book? Like, when did you decide about it? See, in 2011-10, I was into reporting. Uh, I was just six months old into reporting. I began reporting uh, in December 2010. So, June 2011, my editor one day called me. Okay, I have an assignment. I have a vacancy in Chhattisgarh. Would you like to go? I said, okay, let's go. So, now, coming to your question that when did I decide about it? Or thought about yeah, it, yeah. Okay. About, about a book within a month, within a few months. Oh, really? Because the experience of being in, in the central Indian forest at that point of time was so overwhelming for me, who had zero experience of, forget the forest life of even village life. I have been a city bred cosmopolitan, uh, born, if, I was not born in a cosmopolitan city, but then I, I studied in Bombay, then I lived in Delhi, journalism in Delhi. So, uh, the experience of, uh, say, cities like Galchiroli, uh, Abujmal, Bhandara, uh, and Telangana, and parts of Jharkhand. So, this was so overwhelming for me. It, it was, as I said in the beginning, it was, constant, it was a constant reminder of the vast other about which I had never, uh, I was not even aware of. I immediately wanted to write about this other, converse with this other in my, uh, in my writings. So one form was through journalism, another form was through a book. That's how the idea of, uh, of a book came about. 
Interesting. Um, and then this is a book of non-fiction, obviously VLF is a festival of non-fiction books. But it is, and you have uh, said somewhere in Hindi, this is uh, Upanyas ki shakl mein ek, ek non-fiction, uh, agalp kitab hai. So it's, it's, it's a non-fiction book in the form of a novel. Now, while writing a non-fiction, you have a responsibility and then in the style and the form, if it is a novel's form, right, that gives you some liberty and, and probably another responsibility of the other side. How did you strike a balance? Because I, reading this book, I can say you, you really have uh, uh, respected the form of uh, non-fiction, obviously, I mean, on facts and figures and stating it. But then it is also the, the style, right? This balance, did you like, you, were you conscious about it or did it just came like it? I was extremely conscious about the form that I was choosing then. Mm -hmm. uh, as I have said earlier also in my previous interviews, before I came to the form which is in this book, I first toyed with the idea of the book having been a, a book of reportage, diaries, journals. For the first two years, I wrote this book as a book of my personal diary, personal travelogue. I in fact got several of, the, of those extracts published elsewhere as well. But soon I realized, no, it, it can't work like that. The, ex, the, the experience that I was gathering was insufficient for a simple travelogue. I then decided to write it as a novel. For the next two or three years, I wrote a novel, uh, 30, 40,000 words. But once again, at the end of third year, I realized, no boss, this is also not working. So I trashed that as well. So then this book came about, which begins with a sentence. It's a non-fiction book, but it begins with a sentence. My name is Korsa Joga. I was killed on so-and-so date. So how can a dead man narrate a tale in a book of non-fiction? I, I mean, it is uh, going by the genre of you. That's, it's not possible at all. It's a highly fiction, anybody would, it's a novel, yeah. So I fictionalize the narrative. So in this book, if you see, not only this, the opening character, there are several characters uh, who are dead, who come out, uh, out of their graves to, to narrate their tales. Because it occurred to me that it's best that if they tell their own stories, in their own language. So that's why there are several linguistic experiments as well. If you see the language changes from chapter to chapter. Yes. Which is, uh, the experiment becomes, even more visible when you go to Hindi or maybe to Marathi, the addition which is being… Be, uh, whichever uh, word you, uh, phrase you want to yeah, use. Yeah, so now the book is uh, obviously uh, centered around the Maoist insurgency or the left-wing extremism or Naxalite violence, whichever uh, word you would like to call it. Uh, and in this book, and we will come to the, the subject matter uh, after this question, in this book you have… Uh, you many uh, places you quote from mythology, Hindu mythology, uh, other, and you quote extensively from Ramayana and, and Mahabharat, right? Uh, and like Mahabharat was a war, uh, this is also a war. Who are the Kauravas, who are the Pandavas in, in, in this war? Like? I have refrained from uh, taking sides in this book, so therefore for me it's a treacherous battle. I have not uh, mentioned who, who are the Kauravas. You have not, but, but I mean… No, it, the <laughs> fact, if I have not, it means that in my consciousness, yes. there is no distinction that, that remains. So yes. what is the parallel like? The, the, like Mahabharata, there is no right side and no wrong, wrong side. In the Mahabharata, there is. Okay. Well, if you go by the text of the Mahabharata, there is. certainly. When the yes. Draupadi says, by the famous statement, uh, Gandhari says, Jaha dharma vahi vijay ho. So, there is a dharma in Mahabharata. Okay. Uh, now we come to the insurgency and, and, and the issues related to it, but there, there can be people who need to be initiated into it. So if you would mind a minute or two's uh, very primer on, on what the Naxal insurgency is all about. I am presuming that uh, not many are aware of the insurgency here. So just uh, uh, in a brief, I'll uh, cap it up. So, like we have had several ideologies uh, during the freedom movement, we had an ideology which was say carried forward by uh, Tagore, uh, Tagore and Gandhi, then Nehru, then Bose, then Savarkar, then Gorse, etc, etc. There was also an ideology by uh, our leftist uh, politicians. And within those leftists also there was a particularly revolutionary ideology who believed that 
the present system works uh, only for a particular class and not for the proletariat, not for the poor people, not for the ordinary people. So this is that leftist ideology who wants to overthrow the state by means of a violent revolution and establish a state which they believe works best for the common people. So there have been, there had been some insurrections uh, right after the independence by people, uh, by these leftist revolutionaries who believed there's this Ajadi Jhuti, who didn't believe in the, in the, in our freedom. So in 1967, in a village of, uh, in a village called Naxalbadi of West Bengal, there erupted a movement called Naxalism, which then spread to various parts of the country. So it had several factions in Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Telangana, uh, even in South India or Bengal, uh, which then together, they, roughly I'm trying to explain, which loosely acquired the name of Naxalism or later upon Maoism, who wanted to wage a war against the Indian state and overthrow the Indian state. This is in a brief. This is the st story of Naxal insurgency. Cool. And then uh, we come to Bastar, which is probably the hotbed or the, the, the center of the uh, fiercest violence that this country has seen, especially from 2005, say, to 2010 or 12. Uh, the, the figures of, of death and violence has been very, very peak. Uh, you have not only covered the, the incident, you have lived with, uh, for, for a, almost a month with the moist gorillas and, and you like traverse the, the jungles of Abujmad with them. Uh, can we understand who these people are, like what is their demographics in, 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 a, in a very nutshell, like who are these people, who are these soldiers and who are the leaders? They're like me and you, anybody, maybe somebody, of, who, who knows who might be an Excel gorilla here. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I don't know if uh, all of you are here from Nagpur, right? Your natives are. Uh, okay. I, I don't know if you know that a lot of Naxal gorillas would come to Nagpur from Abhujmal for which I mentioned in my book also for their medical treatment and for their other kinds of needs. And s several of them were recruited for Nagpur as well. So who are these people? I mean, they're Indians, they're Indian citizens. What do they want? They believe in a leftist ideology. What do they want? They want to overthrow the state. So, yeah, that's it. And then there is this narrative uh, in, in the mainlands in Chhattisgarh that the food soldiers are uh, simple Adivasis who have been fooled into ideology by people from Andhra Pradesh and Telangana who are the leaders and they just uh, use the Adivasis as fodder maybe and cannon. Yeah, that's an argument. Uh, so for that we need to understand that around the 1980s, uh, the urban educated gorillas from Warangal and other districts, and one very prominent from Maharashtra also, Kobat Gandhi's wife, if you remember, the Anuradha, Anuradha who was uh, Shanbagh originally, who was a Maharashtrian, and Anand Tel Tumre, for instance. Uh, so, Milan Tel Tumre, I'm sorry, yeah. So, they uh, made Dandakarane or Bastar their base camp, and Adivasis uh, their foot soldiers. This is how it began. So, Adivasis who did not have any political rights, who were often tortured by the state's apparatus. Adivasis found it very easy, uh, very simple to be attracted towards the Nexal ideology. So this is how they joined the battle. Okay. Before 2005, the, the violence was very sporadic or, or you know, not the, the kind of violence that we, we had seen previously. But what happened after 2005? What, what happened after Salva Judum, uh, uh, you know, a moment that was organized? the leadership of uh, late Congress leader Mahendra Karma. Why did it peak after it, like, if you could just educate? See, this is plain history. Uh, it's available everywhere. I, am, I, I don't know if I have any uh, insight here, but the facts are these, that in June 2005, uh, three major uh, events took place in a space of couple of days. People are unable to uh, locate them, unable to find a correlation with, uh, among these events. But what were those events? Tatas formed a major MOU with the Chhattisgarh government for a big steel plant in Bastar. A day or two before or, uh, before or after, prime, the deep Prime Minister Manmohan Singh termed the Nexels the biggest internal security threat. A day or two before or after, I'm forget, I may be forgetting the dates, uh, Salva Judum, which is 
a movement which was a movement to officially evict the Nexels from Bastar was launched. So I, uh, please try to understand this the correlation. There's a major uh, MOU agreement to set up a steel plant. Countries, uh, Prime Minister declares them the biggest security threat. And then uh, uh, security forces uh, backed by the government, they launch a movement to clear Bastar. So yeah, so I think that it's very clear. And this is launched by a government uh, uh, ruled by the BJP and, and le led by a leader who belongs to an opposition party. Well, uh, throughout the history, yeah. all political parties have been on the same line. I think it's because we don't understand them, uh, they have a clarity about it. Now you have to give it to our political rulers, our leaders, that they know how to, uh, that they have been, they might have been bickering in public about certain, uh, certain things. But when it comes to certain issues, they do have show some, uh, some kind of equanimity or unanimity on, 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 on certain issues. Bastar has been one of them. Now this putting people against their own, like, you know, I mean, Salva Jodo uh, eventually materialized in Adivasis fighting against their own. This seems like a very unique experience that the state has done ever because you don't see something similar in the Northeast while the state had been handling insurgency for many, many decades now. In Kashmir, we see people like Kuka Pare, yes, I mean, people who, who were ex-rebels, uh, 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 you know, take a unique, unique kind of experiment. Why would the state do it? Like, were they so frustrated or exhausted? Like, I would say it's not unique as such. It's unfortunate. It's tragic. It's ironical. It's unconstitutional. I mean, you cannot give arms to a 16 or 17-year-old boy who is mostly illiterate, you cannot give him an AK-47 or insas rifle and ask him to, do, uh, to go to the jungle and fight against his former family members. So please understand, who were the, who were the Salva Jodum uh, soldiers? They were young boys who were giving insas and AK-47s in the name of special uh, police officers. So this boy then, in order to settle his, his or her past rivalry with the other fam family members, you can imagine what would they do. So the state government, Chhattisgarh government then, does the, what right do you have to give arms to, to give deadly weapons to a two young boy? That was a tragedy of Salva Judo. That is a tragedy of Bastar. There had been many tragic events even after Salva Jodom and, and, and some names uh, hound the memories, especially the, the citizens uh, of the state where I come from, Chhattisgarh. One of them has been, uh, the name is Sarke Goda. And that story somehow, uh, you know, also involves you in, 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 a, in a role, if I may, um, if I could say that. Um, uh, for, for the benefit of the audience there, what was your experience, what happened and then what, what, where did you... Well, Sarki Gula was perhaps one of the most tragic uh, incident and, uh, that I had ever eyewitnessed. It was uh, in June 2012, which is less than a year after I was relocated there. And I saw dead bodies, I saw bodies of several Adivasis who had been killed 36 years before in a CRPF firing. Home Minister P. Chidambaram then had said, that they were Nexels. The Chhattisgarh government had termed it to be a biggest Nexel encounter. But I was perhaps the only journalist who managed to reach the site, the encounter site, which was deep in the jungle, before the body bodies were cremated, and established through a series of reports that they were not Nexels, they were Adivasis. But the, let me tell you the tragedy here. I'll take just a minute. What, what was the tragedy? These bodies did not have bullet marks. These, several of these bodies had dagger wounds. What does it mean? They were not killed in a crossfire. They were stabbed up close. Right? So it, they were not, they didn't die in a firing. So uh, their relatives, realizing me that I have come from Delhi, I'm a, I'm a journalist from an English speaking an English newspaper, they uh, bared those naked bodies and they asked me to take photographs, which I have recorded in my, in, in my uh, book with vivid detail. But I, back then, I did not have the moral courage to take photographs of naked bodies. So I let it go like that, I, without taking the photographs. Of course, my newspaper trusted me, so we ran that story. 
right? That Ashtosh, that I am, that I saw, uh, dagger wounds and the CRPF brutalized these bodies and all. A day later, Ministry of Home Affairs directly rejected my report saying that they had videographed uh, the entire incident and they, there wasn't any dagger wound in that. So there was immense pressure on me as well as my new, on my newspaper for retracting my report, right? You understand, right? Okay, and the CRPF officials also told me, okay, boss, you are wrong. We have seen our, uh, we have our post-mortem report and there is uh, no dagger wound. So I told them, okay, fine. Can you, can you share with me the post-mortem post report? If that is the case, I will happily retract. retract. And then I also asked them, but how do you then explain? Because please trust me, I had seen those dagger wounds with my naked eyes. You have to trust me. They said, okay, I, I trust you completely. We trust you completely. But was there not a possibility that a father stabbed the dead body of his own son in order to implicate us as the security forces? Think about it. I said, imagine. Okay, what do I do then? Fortunately for me, Within 72 hours, I managed to obtain the post-mortem video. And you wouldn't believe the country's topmost senapati, the who, who, who duty used to protect us, they lied through their teeth. There were clear dagger wounds in those bodies. So then I went, my editor called me, I went, then went to the North Block, and I went to the CRPF office, I went to the DG's office, and I, I, with my laptop in my hand, and then I showed the laptop to him. Hey boss, aap yehi video ki baat kar rahe the na? Is this a video you were telling me? Tragic. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, a commission of inquiry was formed and… Yeah, that's a later uh, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it found that it was really… Uh, yeah, the okay. commission, the, after my story, the judicial commission was set up, which later, uh, several years later, which validated every single sentence that I had written then. That they were innocent, they were that, yeah, that, that came later. Many uh, such incidents, like another that haunts the memory uh, is, is Tar Metla, where almost 75 CRPF uh, Jawans were killed. And while this was probably the biggest uh, uh, in, in terms of number of Jawans being killed, this keeps happening. And then you think, uh, you know, what is the reason? I mean, are the Naxals able to kill the police convoys or, or forces convoys at will is, is what we would ask. And the second thing is with each such incident, uh, the, the first thing that the government says is the, the, the Jawans did not follow a standard operating procedure, right? On, on these two, what is your view? Like can they kill at will and, and the SOPs? When they wanted, they, once upon a time, no longer, they were mild, supremely powerful and they could kill at will. They could attack any thana, they could overrun a jail at will. But the capacity has considerably declined. Also because we now have far more four battalions in Bastar, a whole of Dandekaran yeah. than earlier. But I would like to mention a point here. We also need to understand that war is a brutal entity. It kills all the empathy that you may have. It's not just about the CRPF people. Naxals also, they don't just kill their enemy, they brutalize their bodies. Mahind Karma's body, I had seen the post-mortem report. I had never seen such a post-mortem report. It had 76 wounds. I mean, a man can be killed by just one single bullet. Why do you have to torture that man? 76 wounds it had. So, they, you, you cannot even imagine. It destroys you completely from within. War zone really affected you but but again like I'll come back to this perennial uh, statement that standard operating procedures are not followed so we, they have a warfare jungle jungle warfare it's a school joke in actually right? so yeah. SOP uh, yeah SOP is the standard operating procedure which is a manual given to a soldier that you have to follow this in t whenever you are facing any crisis situation but we all know that all these SOPs they are ever evolving when you are facing a bullet coming from the enemy, I mean, you have to devise your own SOP at the moment. If you, if you know that, if you have any reason to believe that you are going in a vehicle and there might be a landmine ahead, so you will have to take a detour, you will have to turn that side. Now you can say that I violated my SOP by taking that route, but boss, I knew that there might be a landmine there. So yes, in some cases, 
soldiers do not follow the SOP, but in many cases, SOPs are not cast in stone. Yes. Who is giving these landmines and weapons to the Naxals? Like, are they are they getting it from ISI or, no, or no. China? No, 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 not not at all. It's all homemade. Okay. It's a homemade home grown insurgency, and all these uh, armory it is being looted from the police. Home. Looted by the, the looted the, from the police, from the security force, forces, from the forces. Uh, you, I mean, let, let's talk about it because we have less time. Uh, you lived with the insurgents for a month almost. Uh, how was that experience, and and what is the routine of a guerrilla? Because you've seen it up close, like. Well, they are always on the move. They they don't have any permanent home, so to mm -hmm. say. Uh, they live in makeshift camps. Uh, they wake up around say five or six, then do, do their morning roll call, and then they move to another location after some initial breakfast and all. And then through the day, they keep on moving around the jungle and they will be visiting some villages, meeting Adivasis, taking meetings of Adivasis, indoctrinating them, uh, teaching them about uh, their ideology, or making certain plannings throughout the day. Uh, maybe weapon practice or physical combat practice, all the time keeping a very close eye on the end possibility of any police movement around. And then when they go to bed, there are always uh, a group of sentries who are on their night vigil duty one after another. There are so, stories of the four uh, villagers from Murga and, and, and Bakra and you know, they would uh, extract money and all. I mean, did you, did you watch any of such things happen? I didn't watch it, but yeah, it's true because uh, yeah. They do take their ration from villagers. That, of course, that I saw from my own eyes. Yeah. They, it's not that they are getting from somewhere else. And, and three PDS is reaching them. How did they treat you? Like, like all, all those days, I mean. <laughs> like he is treating me with great love and affection. <laughs> I was their host, to be, to be sure. I was their host and they treated me enormous affection. Uh, last, my last day, they wanted to throw a party uh, for me, my farewell dinner. So... Uh, for them, the fa farewell means mutton. So I said, boss, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm a vegetarian. So then they ordered jalebis for me. And you can, you can imagine the jalebi in a jungle in Abujmal. So somebody had to go to a village which was several hours away. Then uh, obviously you can't get fresh jalebi. So by the time they had arrived, they were all stale and all dried up. But yeah, that's their love. Human beings everywhere. By, by button, I remember uh, this word, which is a French word actually, mutton uh, for meat, um, goat meat actually, uh, has reached Bastar in a, in a very different way. You mentioned a gorilla using mutton for, for, for many other things like, I mean. Yeah. Uh, See, a gorilla's vocabulary, uh, an Adivasi gorilla, they are traditionally uh, gaunts. So they have acquired some of these words from our uh, vocabulary. So. Uh, mutton they use uh, for just say agar goli lagegi to mutton nikal aayega <laughs> hai na yahan se mat jao bhalu aayega to mutton khinch lega so that gorilla has perhaps it has he has understood ke mutton ko kahin bhi it's synonymous with all kinds of flesh they ha, they know nothing about basic things like electricity they have never seen uh, one somebody would ask me ke bhai shehar mein kuch aisa hota hai ke garmiyon mein kuch upar chalta hai jisse aapko uh, garmi nahi lagti hai ye acha शहर में कुछ ऐसा होता है कि कुछ अपने आप आपको लकड़ी नहीं लगानी पड़ती है, so they have no idea of it, so they might be talking about the capitalist America or the capitalist Germany and England, they do not, they have never, they have never stepped out of the jungle, so they are living a very ironic, a very tragic life in a way. Within the confines of a jungle, they have created a makeshift world in which you have America, you have England, you have Indian capitalism. Um, uh, Dandakarani, you have also traveled to neighboring states. You, you, you went to Himalkasa. I think many people know what Himalkasa is here. And then you also went to Jharkhand, Bihar. How is the insurgency different uh, in, in Jharkhand and Bihar and from, from that in Dandakarani? That's a long question, but I would just say that insurgency is also made up of its local soldiers. Just like how Maharashtrians are different from uh, Jharkhandis, how Jharkhandis are different from uh, Andhra Pradesh, the people from Telangana. Similarly, the character of insurgency also changes. 
so in when you talk about bastar that is adivasi land the insurgent movement gets more and more adivasiized whatever the term may mean when it goes to telangana which is far more educated uh, where you have uh, more uh, engineers doctors joining the movement the insurgency gets an intellectual flavor when it travels to garcharoli or even nagpur or parts of bombay then it becomes you can imagine it becomes increasingly cosmopolitan also or when it reaches delhi so this is how the character of the insurgency changes as per the character of its uh, of its uh, of its members now let's come to some ideological uh, references or questions one is this there is insurgency and violence because there is no development and then you if if you develop quote and quote uh, the the area there will be less and less of violence and one uh, evidence is uh, in abujmard the maharashtra side of abujmard which is the garchiroli district um, and surrounding is probably probably more developed if you compare it to the part in chatisgarh and then you see less violence in 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 these areas so what is your thought about this development uh, paradigm that people talk see, about see development is one issue but as i said in the beginning the leftist insurgency believes that the state is fake they don't believe in the state therefore they will they have a right to overthrow the state wherever possible so you see there have been instances when a senior ips officer was killed while he was jogging in a stadium in hyderabad i mean hyderabad is among the most developed cities of the of of of, of, the, of the country so how could insurgency spread there so development is one reason yeah i agree but the insurgency uh, is not located limited only to these areas i mean the thought is uh, they will lose support if, if there was relatively better uh, schools uh, hospitals yeah but lose support of whom lose support of their local people yes as i said in the beginning in certain areas the insurgency has an intellectual flavor yes in, uh, in andhra pradesh for instance or in in the 60s or 70s and 80s of maharashtra i mean some of the topmost guerrilla leaders they came from brilliant and rich families of maharashtra so so this whole idea that uh, development alone can counter that uh, that is slightly weak okay because it's an ideology now there is another argument on how the maoist movement is destroying the adivasi culture um and, and we have seen what mao did i mean agree or don't agree to 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 with his cultural revolution in china though it, it seems very less likely that they 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 want to do that in bastar but it has indeed changed the lifestyle and way of life of adivasis that is true but i would like to answer it by this way that any dominant force will damage or affect or destroy the life of the people where it visits for instance the state go our, our state for instance when it uh, creates roads in bastar when it sets up security camps in bastar when it brings dth and uh, mobile phone and uh, smartphones in bastar does it not affect or destroy their lives i mean this it it also does that so it's a very tricky argument uh, one more question is uh, there are three words adivasi tribal and if i may vanwasi so so right wing would love to call them vanwasis they would call themselves adivasis and the state uh, recognizes them as tribals and and you mentioned that in your book i mean would you just put a little light on it see the tribal is an official word it's a constitutional category it was devised by the indian state before that the colonial state to identify several communities uh, back then which it believed were criminal or have a tendencies to be criminal uh, if you remember in the eight, late 19th century they were uh, uh, termed as notified tribes adivasi is a political term of political assertion like dalit like schedule caste is a legal term is a constitutional term dalit is a term of political assertion right scheduled tribes may also be fairly rich fairly influential like for instance scheduled tribes of himachal pradesh or northeast the himachal pradesh uh, the scheduled tribes of lahore and spiti they dominate our uh, bureaucracy even st's meena of rajasthan they are very powerful 
Meelas you will find there are many Adivasi, there are many Meelas who are in, in bureaucracy. But the Adivasis of Central India, who technically are also scheduled tribes, but they have very poor representation. They are not influential enough, they are not rich enough, they, are not, they do not even constitute a vote bank or a homogeneous community. community. So this is the differentiation between the two terms, Adivasi and scheduled tribes. Not all Adivasis are scheduled tribes. I mean, uh, sorry, they are scheduled tribes technically, but they, they are not comparable. Yes. Uh, we, we spoke a lot about the Adivasis. There is also other side which is, which is facing the violence very severely, which is the Jawans. And these are the people who join the forces from UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh. What is their plight? Did you, did you, I mean, you obviously met them and spoke to a lot of such people. What are the experiences? Like the experience of any uh, soldier in India, like experience of any policeman, you just go to the, your chorha uh, pe jaiye kahin, look at the plight of the policeman. We, we, we always tend to abuse our police forces. But you see, it's been a long time in the night. It's been a long time in So the police forces, security forces are the most abused, yet they are the ones who bear the maximum brunt. They are the ones who ensure the security. Yes, but, but when, when they are at a war zone on the border, it is different. You have this full force of the army. And when you are in Dandakar and as a soldier, and Naxals can probably kill you at will. I mean, at, at that point, I mean, it is kind of why am I forced into this, this battle, right? I mean, that is very unrecognizable enemy, actually. Um, being with the insurgents, I mean, what was the experience of your interactions with the forces? I mean, the officers especially, would they, does the police uh, suspect the journalists there or, or is there any tension or friction between the two? There is, uh, like it, I would say it is natural for a police officer or a CRPF commander to be suspicious of a journalist. I would respect their right, I would grant them a right to be suspicious of me. I mean, why should they not be suspicious of me? Because they know that I am going to do something which can uh, reveal certain uh, truths about their, uncomfortable truths about their life. So this is their right, but this is the beauty of a democracy that we all uh, negotiate like a journalist and a security for, for officer. We negotiate, we confront, we argue and we debate and they give me my space, I give them their space. Uh, Let me add a point yeah, here please, please, because, please. because uh, security officers, they are often the most abused lot. Most of my reporting from these difficult areas, conflict areas, be, be it uh, the Dandik, be it the Central Indian Forest or even Kashmir, it would not have been possible had there not been some very supportive security for some officers with me. There were people who were always there to help me out. There were people who always there to who were always there to offer me their computers, their desktops, their pen drives, in order to file, so that I could file my reports. From where do I get electricity in the jungle? From where do I get uh, internet in the jungle? It's only because of them. I, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of my work without their help. Two more questions and then we move on to audience uh, for the question. Uh, I'll just give a heads up. We have 10 minutes left, so we'll be entertaining three questions uh, now. Did you ever feel that you are going to be a part of death script? Where, when were you most scared during your part of reporting? Oh, all the time. In fact, the last chapter says that I am on my yet another trip to jungle and uh, whenever I come here, I come with the belief this is going to be my last trip. I won't be able to go out, my body will vanish without any trace, nobody would ever be able to come to know from uh, where did I go. Because I venture into a zone where there is no electricity, no internet, nothing. So after this point, I am all on my own. Nobody can help me, no police officer can help me, no friendly state government can help me. Why? Because you do not know. I, I give you one instance quickly, in uh, January 2021, I was about to, well, there are two kinds of landmines. One which explodes by a trigger, right, where you have to uh, detonate, there is a detonator. There are another kind of landmines which explode by the pressure of a footstep, right. So, and Dandikaran is full of such landmines. 
so you can you your bike your cycle can any you can always you can be the unsuspecting victim of such a landmine so in january 2021 i passed through an area uh, i was i was supposed to pass through that area where some jawans who were on a patrol that morning had unearthed a landmine just 15 minutes before so when i was going through the area i saw them are ye kya kar rahe hain bhai sahab dekhiye abhi abhi landmine nikla hai yahan se so there's always this this possibility but that's oh. very honest of you to accept that that you were really scared yeah 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 so i i am a human being look i know that i am i have risking my life but yeah there is some joy some thrill some passion i have detailed it that why do i take the why do i want to put myself again and again into into death's jaws good afternoon asutosh uh as an insider as somebody who has studied this phenomenon from up close do you foresee any possible closure to this uh, problem with each successive government mishandling the issue uh, is it finally going to die a natural death or uh, how do you see this uh, ending see at least the violence has come to a decline massive decline they have lesser numbers now their recruitment has gone down their armory stands depleted majorly depleted there are several reasons for that no point going in here Uh, but yes the insurgency is on the decline and if it remains so maybe in the five next 5 6 or 7 years bastar may get cleared at all yes uh, yeah ye kafi hat tak sahi hai maine pehle hi aapko yaad ho shuruaat mein yahi keh raha tha ki unko ye lagta hai ki हमारी जो जो हमारी सरकार है जो लोकतंत्र है वो जनता के लिए नहीं है वो चुने हुए लोगों के लिए है मेरे ख्याल से इस पर तो शायद ही कोई असहमत होगा हम में से कितने लोग हैं जो इस बात में यकीन करते हैं कि हमारी सरकारें हैं हमारा लोकतंत्र वो बुरी तरह से धन तंत्र है भ्रष्टाचार तंत्र है वो हम लोगों की नहीं सुनता है हम सभी मानते हैं हम अगर हथियार नहीं उठाते हैं तो इसलिए हमारे अंदर कुछ आस्था बची हुई है लोकतंत्र में नंबर एक नंबर दो हमारा जीवन इस अहिंसक प्रणाली में सुरक्षित है मैंने कहा ना हमारा जीवन इस 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 प्रणाली में सुरक्षित है अगर हम सुरक्षित नहीं होते इस व्यवस्था में नागपुर में दिल्ली में अगर पूरा देश बस्तर की तरह होता तो शायद देखिए सरकारें हमारे अधिकारों की रक्षा नहीं कर पा रही हैं ये तो तय है इसमें हमें मानने में कोई संकोच नहीं है ना बस्तर में ना दिल्ली में एक, एक आखिरी सवाल नो नो लेडी हैज आस्क्ड एनी क्वेश्चंस आई मीन प्लीज डू एक काम कीजिए दो तीन लोग एक साथ पूछ ले देन आई विल ट्राई टू समझ हेलो आशुतोष हाय हाय मेरा सवाल ये है कि आप बस्तर में काम कर चुके हैं और मैं भी वहां काम कर चुके हूं लेकिन मैं एक ट्राइब भी हूं मतलब आप क्या हैं मैं मुरिया ट्राइब अच्छा मुरिया हैं आप अरे वाह तो मैंने ये देखा है जैसे मंगल कुंजाम है या लिंगा कोडोपी है और हिड़मे मर काम है जब वो नक्सलिज्म और फोर्स के बीच ऐसा कन्वर्सेशन करते हैं उन लोगों का बातचीत चलता है तो दोनों दोनों जो साइट है वो उनको हमेशा सक के घेरे में देखती है तो आपका ऐसा कुछ एक्सपीरियंस रहा है क्योंकि एक ट्राइबल के लिए काफ़ी मुश्किल होता है लालसू सुमा नागोटी जब सिलगेर के प्रोटेस्ट में जा रहे थे तो उनको रोक दिया गया वो जा ही नहीं पाए उन लोगों से मिल ही नहीं पाए और ये चीज़ हमारे साथ भी होता है मैं फेमिनिज्म इन इंडिया में जर्नलिस्ट हूँ तो मैंने ये चीज़ फेस किया है तो बस मेरा ये सवाल है आपसे मैं बताता हूँ कोई और हो तो एक दो प्रश्न एक साथ ले लूंगा मैं हाँ सर पहले उनका जवाब देता हूँ फिर आपके पास आऊँगा तो ये सही बात है कि मैंने जो आपको पहले भी बताया था कि जो हमारी सत्ता है वो हम सब पे शक करती है और नक्सल भी एक किस्म की सत्ता ही है देखिए सत्ता का स्वभाव है शक करना उसको आप इस तरह देखिए सत्ता बिना संदेह के बिना शक के नहीं जी पाएगी वो बहुत ही बेईमान किस्म की होती है वो किसी भी तरह की वो इतनी ईमानदार नहीं है तो इसलिए वो शक करेगी ठीक तो जैसे मैंने पहले कहा उसको करने दीजिए हम अपना काम करेंगे तो कठिन हो जाता है जीवन आपके लिए भी मेरे लिए भी लेंगे ठीक है उसी कठिनाइयों के बीच चलेंगे आपका सवाल सर वी गेट द मीडिया वी डिजर्व हाउ मेनी टाइम्स यू हैव इन्वेस्टेड इन रीडिंग सम सॉलिड न्यूज रिपोर्ट्स व्हाट काइंड ऑफ मीडिया डू यू वॉच ऑन योर मोबाइल फोन व्हाट काइंड ऑफ जर्नलिस्ट यू रेफर टू यू ऑन योर मोबाइल फोन Who are the journalists who believe are the journalists, quote unquote, journalists of this country? I mean, unfortunately, we have been swayed by YouTube uh, reels, 
uh, I mean, real, real journalism has been replaced by TV shows, TV anchorings. Who are the most famous names of, in, in Indian journalism? TV anchors, who, they, who do not step out of their, uh, of, on all sides, right wing, left, center, across, I'm saying about. So it's up to you to, I mean, because you watch those TV shows, therefore there are more and more YouTube journalists, because you don't read newspaper reports, you don't know about, you don't want to know about people who step out into the forest. That's the case. Thank you. I think the time is up. Prajanan? No, Naksal Vadiyo ne apne bheeter istri purush ke beech mein tamam kisme ke pratibandh lagai hu hai. Prajanan par bhai pratibandh hai. Gine chune case hu hai, 40 saal ke tiyas mein 2, 3, 4. Nahi to wahan nahi, wo sambhav nahi hai wahan. इसलिए फिर वो यहाँ वहाँ आकर वो नसबंदी इत्यादि कराते हैं फिर वो हेमल का सामने भी। I think we have the times हाँ ये भी सही है कई सारे केस ऐसे होते हैं एकदम सही बात है जैसे मैंने बताया था कि कई सारे आदिवासियों को नक्सलवाद एक ऐसी विचारधारा या एक ऐसा संगठन लगता है जहां उन्हें उनके अधिकार कुछ मिल जाएंगे इसलिए वो उनसे जुड़ जाते हैं थैंक यू आशुतोष आई थिंक टाइम इज अप राइट अ प्लेजर टॉकिंग टू यू एंड एंड थैंक यू ऑल फॉर लिसनिंग सो पेशेंटली सर कुड यू जस्ट वेट फॉर अ मिनट वी हैव अ गिफ्ट फॉर आशुतोष सर व्हिच हैज बीन मेड स्पेशली फॉर हिम बाय एन आर्टिस्ट मैत्रेय लेमचे शी इज एसोसिएटेड विद अलग एंगल शी वाज ब्रीफ्ड ऑन योर बुक एंड शी इज मेड द पेंटिंग बेस्ड ऑन योर बुक Thank you.